Why are clean hands important? Because humans are the most effective incubators of bacteria outside of imported meat. A fact first discovered 150 years ago in Soho, when its filthy reputation was based not on pole dancers from Lapland or lap dancers from Poland, Poland, but because of an outbreak of cholera. Imagine going into a newsagent and ordering not a can of Coca-Cola, but a can of Coca-Cola. That's effectively what the Soho residents were doing in 1854 when they came to draw water from this pump to sate, slake or quench their thirst. That was before the physician John Snow discovered that the disease was spread through contaminated water. And this paved the way for the invention of antibiotics, a remedy against bacteria that initially seemed infallible. I said initially slightly louder because Whilst antibiotics once stopped bacteria like these from breeding like randy Catholic rabbits, their prophylactic power has become dulled through overuse. Many liken antibiotics to giving a box of chocolates to an angry spouse. The first time the chocolates will overwhelm the wife and quell her ire completely. The sixth, seventh time, the chocolates still subdue the miffed woman, but less than they had earlier. And by the twentieth time, the chocolates have little to no potency and can even inflame the problem further. I was troubled by this. I knew more than ever before that we needed to wash our hands. But were we doing? To find out for myself, I've come to the gents' toilets at the BBC to conduct a study of my own. Hello, Alan Partridge, BBC. Uh, did you wash your hands? Yep. Good man. I've concentrated exclusively on the gents' loos. Uh, a man standing outside a women's lavatory can be seen as predatory. Equally, a man loitering outside a gentleman's toilet uh, can be fraught with ambiguity. So, uh, to put it on a more formal footing, I've got this woman with a clipboard. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Thera. Sarah. Thera. Sarah. Thera. OK. The BBC employs some 20,000 people. Just write that down. And not all of them are going to wash their hands. Right, it is Thera. I thought, I thought you had a list. <laughs> no, it's Arabic. OK. Menial workers, for example, are employed to pick up bits of dirt, and the likelihood of them ever being asked to shake hands with senior management are very low. Put him down as a no. Still, the results made for grim reading, with just 28% saying they washed their hands. Yeah, I'm going to wash my own hands later. <coughs> Swindon. And I've come to the British School of Hygiene to ask Professor Jean Chowdhury how clean hands can stop the spread of germs. Hi, Jean. Hi. Hi. Jean, hand washing, how often should we be washing them? Well, any time we come into contact with bacteria. So, um, after going to the toilet. Agreed. Uh, after handling raw meat. Right, and that's separate, isn't it? That's not a euphemism for the first one. No. Uh, raw meat can harbour some pretty nasty bacteria, so if in doubt, wash. And the advice from the World Health Organisation is that we should be washing our hands for a full 20 seconds. 15 is fine. Which is why there's actually an instructional video which shows exactly how to wash your hands. Mm. Yes, please. So we begin by rubbing the palms together, work up a nice creamy lather. Those are very creamy hands. And then you rub the back of your left hand with the right palm with interlaced fingers. Yeah. And same with the other hand. Yeah. And rinse with warm water. Yeah. Um, that's, those taps are the same as the ones over there. Oh, yeah, we shot it here. Well, so those are uh, your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind. So said Elton John about Marilyn Monroe, Princess Diana. The list goes on. But John was bigger than a mere candle. It seemed to me he lived his life like an oil rig flare stack in a North Sea gale. Like an oil rig, he drew on huge reserves of energy, was physically quite squat, and thanks to his prodigious whiskey intake, help prop up the economy of Scotland. Your candle burned out long before your legend ever did, continued Elton. And it's no exaggeration to say that Scotland's vast reserves of oil and gas would burn out long before John's legend is ever forgotten. Exaggeration, possibly. Sentimental nonsense, again, unwise to rule it out. But there is broad agreement that John was good. The former BBC television centre.
John had a real appetite for this donut shaped building and snaffled his way along the corridors, gorging on the opportunity as he chomped his way to the top. His big break, or mouthful, coming in 1985 with the BBC's getaway. And it needn't cost you a king's ransom. Consisting largely of John in teeming holiday resorts, sampling oh, cooked breakfasts in blazing sunshine, the show was, like the man himself, cheap and cheerful. A great show. Terrible reviews saw it cancelled before the end of its run. But it alerted the BBC's early warning system to John's talent, and he was now a big fat blip on their radar. This led to what John called his golden period, a veritable roll call of Britain's best loved telly. Scotland's strongest man, cash chaser, Britain's holiest hymn, fly tip squad, Britain by balloon, Gibraltar CID. Which is why in 2012 he was named host of new magazine show This Time, delighting us all with puns about hedgehogs being prickly. Prickly customers. <laughs> John Baskell, what was he like? Oh, what are you like? Yes, it seemed to me you lived your life like a candle in the wind. A simple stream in North Walsham, Norfolk. But six centuries ago, this stream would have flowed with the blood and entrails of fallen men. I was hoping to illustrate it by pouring in this bucket of butcher's waste. But some Dilbert at the council seems to think it would contaminate the water supply. So close your eyes instead and imagine bits of dead men bobbing about in red water. This was the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, caused, some say, by underpaying the workers. But there's compelling evidence that low wages actually increases productivity. As Kirsty Allsop says, a well-fed dog is a slow dog. Whatever the pros and cons, there can be no excuse for the peasants' antisocial behaviour. The execution of their ringleaders serving as a timely reminder that laws are there for a reason. Behind me is North Walsham Heath. What today is a pleasant place to rest was once a peasant place of rest, since many of them lay dying here. You see, razzed up on scrumpy and injustice, they brought to the battle only guts and aggression. And as anyone who's played squash against Adrian Childs will tell you, guts and aggression are no match for skill and tactics, unless his opponents had a big breakfast. The battle was bloody. After the first day, the bishop's men set up camp here on the heath, a place for the pooped troops to regroup and recoup. They would have discussed tactics with the free hot meal included. Though potatoes in those days, of course, they hadn't been developed. It was simply lamb shank or the classic chicken. In contrast, one can picture the peasants loaded on cider, weeing into bushes, telling disgusting jokes before attacking the bishop's men in dawn raids. But the lack of organisation meant they were no match for the deft sorcerership and combat nurse of a trained unit. <laughs> the labourers were serfs, their hands more used to drawing milk from a goat teat than wielding a sword. The trained soldiers knew to have one hand on the hilt, the other on the pummel. That is what I do. <laughs> I've got kids. <laughs> Just forgive me. The battle continued. <laughs> The bishop's men fighting off futile frenzy and sometimes rubbish attacks from the peasants. <laughs> the battle continued till dusk. <laughs> the last of the rebels dispatched had a bloody defeat that could have been avoided if the peasants had simply raised their concerns through the correct channels. <laughs> A sobering reminder that war, be it the First World War, the Second World War, or the Great War of China, always takes a heavy toll. We've been fighting. Anna was the winner. To help us look at the discipline of yesteryear, we sent Alan back to his old school. I must warn you that uh, this film contains teachers some viewers may find disturbing. This is St Jude's High School, a secondary specialising in the performing arts and media studies. But back in the 1970s, it was an actual school and I was a pupil here. Today, the corridors of St Jude's are alive with the sound of laughter and play. Back then, however, the school echoed with an altogether different noise.
the noise of corporal punishment. Thrashings were the order of the day back then. The only ways to avoid a walloping, keep out of trouble, or get homeschooled like Dominic Bentham. Although I think he ended up killing himself in his 40s. Alas, for those of us schooled in the classroom, the finger of blame didn't always land on the guilty. Partridge, what is that? Bring it here. And stop gawping for crying out loud. Ordinarily, I'd see a boy taking the long walk to the teacher's desk and think, he was being disruptive. Go on, sir, batter him. But on this occasion, that boy was me. What is it? It's a picture of you, sir, with a penis where your nose should be. Is that what you think I look like? It wasn't me, sir. It was Smithy. He's from a broken home. <laughs> Something changed in me that day. I had walked to school a boy. Now sit down, you lemon. But I returned home. A big boy. Fortunately, what the psychotic teachers of the 1970s <laughs> lacked in self-control, they also lacked in technique. Inexperienced teachers would often opt for a one-handed stroke with little backlift and a short follow-through. But swing analysis from my squash coach reveals this to be both ineffective and inaccurate. With little rotation of the hips, the backswing ends here, which means the maximum arc of the swing is shortened, and an unsteady stance means energy dissipates as the swing is completed. But watch what happens with a firmer base and a longer backlift. In this case, the swing stops here. Look at the line from the shoulder all the way down to the knee. The wider stance creates stability so that energy can be transferred from the standing leg all the way to the front knee. And with the hips rotated right round, the striker is like a coiled spring. If we play on, watch now how all of that force is driven down through the arc of the swing, picking up speed, picking up speed, as the front knee bears all the weight and then POW! The striker hits through the target, continuing to rotate the hips until he ends up in a finishing pose that is the mirror image of the back lift. Impressive. Eventually, corporal punishment was subject to a blanket ban, except in emergencies. But the memories remain. Sore heads, swollen knuckles, rosy red bum cheeks. Sounds funny. Don't feel funny. Hilary Couchman, Dr. Hilary Couchman. How long have you been swearing? Well, curse words or vulgarities go back really as far as language itself, but when it comes to written English, we find profanities cropping up from the 13th century. So, something like this, should I wear gloves to handle this? The protocol is that the curator handles the material. Oh, okay, right. Um, I'm pretty sure I've seen Dr. David Starkey handling stuff like this on TV. And I've even seen them let Tony Robinson have a fiddle. The protocol is the curator handles the material. You said that. Do they ever let you guys go to an area just to relax? Because they, sh they should do. Maybe that should be part of the protocol. Swearing, swear words. One of the more prominent words is the word f But c too is also common across the Germanic and Scandinavian languages. Yeah. We also find uses of p c c c What, 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 where, where? What areas would these profanities emanate from? I'm thinking Manchester, Liverpool. No, from across the whole country. OK. Now, what we have here are parish records from Drayton in Shropshire. Uh, when would that be? 1295. That's what these trousers cost. So, what these documents show is how the earliest instances of swear words were typically found in the names of places or people. Mm -hmm. So, surnames often describe what someone was or did. Right. Here we have a listing for um, Henry f a beggar. Goodness me. Now, back then, the word f didn't have its current meaning. Okay. It actually referred to hitting or striking. Right, good. Uh, well, hence the phrase, let's hire some Albanians to f him up. So there are terms that have fallen out of use. So here in 1740, uh, we have the term rantalian, oh, which means one word. whose scrotum is so relaxed as to be longer than his penis. One wonders whether that's due to a truncated member or a distended testes. Well, I guess it's just chicken and egg. 
Um, we also find some fairly vulgar slang words for penis, such as beard splitter mm -hmm. and arse opener, whilst fellatio was known as bagpiping. Oh, makes sense. In the 1785 book, the classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue, mm -hmm. we find the term to huffle. Would you like to have a guess at what that means? Oh, gosh, I'll have a bash. Um, uh, to huffle, um, the act of putting my head between a lady's breasts and uh, huffling. That's, you get the picture. No, it's, it's another word to fillate. <laughs> Right, OK. I always find it amusing uh, when I ask people that question, what answer I'll get. <laughs> right, well, that's an interesting part of the protocol. Um, thank you very much, Dr Hilary Mantel. Couchman. Well, one who likes to squat over another... It's my surname. Right, yes, of course.